want to welcome everyone back. Uh, we're going to get our second session going. Hopefully you had a nice break. Um, we have a good discussion this morning. Uh, we just had a great discussion. We have another one here. We're talking about challenges facing coaches in women's sports. And we're going to have Mike Counter, he's the director of media relations from St. Norbert College, moderate that discussion for us this morning. I want to tell you a little bit about Mike's background. He joined St. Norbert in 2003 as director of media relations. He manages local, state, and national media relations, helping to share stories about St. Norbert, the students, faculty, staff, and alumni. He also produces the award-winning television show, Conversations from St. Norbert College. He also oversees multimedia projects for the college, which include videos showcasing the talents of students, faculty, and staff. And he has a background in that. And before joining St. Norbert, the communications team, Mike spent 23 years in both TV and radio broadcasting. He was a sports anchor and reporter at WBAY TV in Green Bay. Sorry, our paths never crossed at the same station at the same time. In his seven years, he covered two Green Bay Packers Super Bowl appearances during that span. And Mike received his BA from the University of Wisconsin Green Bay and just completed his Master of Liberal Studies degree at St. Norbert College. And congratulations to you on that, Mike. Also want to welcome our featured panelists today. Kevin Borseth, head coach of women's basketball, UWGB. Amanda Braun, director of athletics from UW-Milwaukee. Rob Morgan, head coach of women's hockey from St. Norbert College. Sarah Rohde, varsity girls basketball coach from Notre Dame Academy. And Connie Tilley, head coach of women's basketball from St. Norbert College. We certainly appreciate you being with us today on behalf of St. Norbert College. We'll welcome Mike and get our discussion underway. Thank you, Tammy. Um, I just want to take a second to thank Tammy personally for emceeing this conference for us. It's May sweeps. It's a busy time. So let's uh, give a round of applause to Tammy Elliott, just a true professional. Thank you. Our topic, as Tammy mentioned, challenges facing coaches in women's sports. So we'll get it going. And as we go through the questions, if, if you have a question, feel free to raise your hand and ask the question. We don't have to wait till the end. So. Feel free to jump in at any time. All right, we'll start with uh, Coach Borseth and Coach Morgan. Coaches, what, what type of challenges do you face being male head coaches directing female sports programs? Rob, you want to start? Sure. Okay. Um, well, I think uh, one of the initial challenges is, is looking to uh, connect with our, our kids on a daily basis and um, <clears throat> you know obviously uh, the locker room them getting changed got to wait till they're uh, changed and ready to go for practice so uh, you know that that's uh, one of the things we have to consider um, you know and also the athletes need to consider uh, at the end of a practice they got to wait or practice and or a game they need to wait uh, to get changed so us coaches can go in there and talk to them and um, you know, and having having a uh, their schedules being so busy, um, you know, they're rushing to the arena, which is off campus, uh, about seven eight minute drive, and they're rushing to get practice, get changed for practice, and get on the ice so that they're ready to go. So it's really hard to find that time to really connect with them and get to know how their days are going uh, outside of you know athletics. Um, I think. Uh, Certainly another challenge, uh, especially in D3, um, women's hockey is, uh, you know, we don't have a full-time assistant coach. And, um, you know, hopefully and you know, over time, and I know our other sports uh, uh, on campus and our women's sports don't have full-time assistants. So it's just that that, that is, is it creates that helps or contributes towards that challenge of being able to connect with our kids and, and make sure that, uh, you know, things are going well and that we're there to be a good support and, and uh, resource for them throughout their careers. Hello. Yeah, here we go. Sorry. I, you know, I, um, I've been doing this now for 30-some years, and I've come to learn that really there's not a whole lot of difference in um, regard to coaching a fee, the female athlete. Um, they're equally as receptive to <clears throat> coaching and some say more receptive than the male are. Um, the only difference between the gals and the guys is that the uh, when you chew a guy out, uh, he'll, he'll kind of 
give a stiff upper lip and say, well, I'll show you, coach, where if you chew the girl out, they kind of all take it personal. That's what I've come to learn over the course of time. But the very tough female athletes are extremely tough, uh, very dedicated, uh, very coachable, which is really good. So in that regard, it's really a good group to coach. Uh, the recruitment aspect, I'm fortunate. I've got three female uh, assistant coaches that help me with recruitment. Um, of course, now you've got Twitter and you've got Facebook. Uh, so many phone calls of things that you have to make. I think the biggest thing is uh, being, being able to connect, probably the biggest thing uh, from a recruitment perspective. And, of course, the females, the younger females, obviously, for me, uh, help in that regard. Uh, as far as the locker room scenarios, they're pretty, pretty standard over the course of time. Not really funny, but there's times when I find myself almost walking into a woman's bathroom because, you know, I, I, I've been involved in women's sports for such a long period of time now. But I think you, you learn... After a while, I think that you, you fight the same battles that the females have fought for years since Title IX came through of, of equal opportunity and being treated as a, as, a, as a, for us, a college student athlete, I think, which has really come a long ways uh, in that regard. But um, there are some challenges. There aren't a lot of challenges. I think the ones that Coach referred to with regard to locker room things and, uh, of course, me having assistant coaches, it makes it a lot easier. So that's probably my, my take. All right, next question is for Coach Tilly. Coach, you're entering your 38th season as head women's basketball coach at St. Norbert College. How has the student athlete changed over the years that you've been coaching? I think the biggest thing uh, for me um, coming from um, even when I was in high school, we did not even start playing five-person basketball till I was a junior in high school. Um, so obviously, even from that point in, in time, I think the athletes themselves, and I was thinking about this um, before, is that even in the early 80s, even late 70s, um, we had really good women's basketball players. Um, they were stretched out a little bit. Most of the athletes that I had, which I also coached, were in basketball, volleyball, and, and softball. Um, so the, the, the basketball players themselves, I don't think, changed as much as the game itself. Uh, we went to a smaller ball. Um, we had the uh, three-point arc change a little bit. Um, I think the athlete right now is very much a one-sport athlete. So the, the athletes are better. The basketball players are better. Um, and there's a lot more of them, um, which makes my job in terms of recruiting to a Division three program even a little bit harder. Um, but I, I remember some of the outstanding All-Americans that we had in the early 80s. Um, were great basketball players and would be great basketball players today. Um, the game, in terms of the players, have changed dramatically in terms of their speed, in terms of their size, and in terms of their strength. So I think in terms of, of a pure basketball player, those are the, the, the things that I see as really developing. And a lot of it is because of the training and conditioning that they do get, the fact that they're, they're playing basketball pretty much all year long uh, really helps and not, not doing a lot of uh, multi-sport kinds of things, especially um, in college. So um, I think the game is, is much quicker uh, than it used to be. But I think as a basketball player, I think we, we still had really great basketball players in the, I guess, the olden days um, as we do now. It's just a little bit more, um, there's a lot more of them and it, it's a lot more specific. This next question is for Sarah boyer Rody. You coach at the high school level, Green Bay Notre Dame Academy. Sarah, what do you see different in high school athletes today compared to when you were in high school? Or is there a difference? I think uh, very similar to what Coach Tilly said, you see a lot more one-sport athletes now. I was actually just talking to one of my former teammates, Tiffany Huck, the other day how when we played in college, we were in high school. I was a three-sport athlete. She was a three-sport athlete. Almost everybody on our team were two or three sport athletes, and now I don't feel like you see that as much because everybody's, all the girls now in high school are specializing in one sport. So, you know, that's, that's challenging. Sometimes it's good if they're specializing in basketball. However, if they're specializing in volleyball or another sport, it's not so, not so good for the basketball coach. But 
Uh, I think that's the biggest difference. And then just that all the girls, you know, they're playing club or AAU, whatever it may be. And I think that's the biggest difference, really, that instead of being three sport athletes or two sport athletes, they're focusing on one sport from the, right from the beginning, and that's what they're going to do. Amanda, there are not a lot of women athletic directors out there. I saw a stat, and I don't know how up to date this is, but it, I saw a stat where they said 4% of women hold athletic director positions at the Division I level. What challenges do you face? What challenges did you face coming up through the ranks, and what have been some of the successes or surprises you've seen? Uh, well, first, I think the 4% might be the FBS level. Uh, it's nearly 10% in Division I overall. So okay. of 350 institutions, roughly, there are about 35 uh, women. So um, some people call that elite company. I call that a shame. Uh, there's a lot of women out there that have a lot to offer. And I think we're, we're going to start to see, uh, see some growth in that area, um, it, it, I'm sure, very quickly. Um, so challenges coming up through. That was the first part of your question. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I had such wonderful leadership uh, to work with. Uh, through my career, great mentors, uh, both men and women, that I kind of, I really just sort of, you have to let certain things roll off your back. Um, a lot of the subtleties of being a woman, it, there's very rarely is there a blatant issue in front of you uh, as a result of you being female um, in a leadership role, whether it's athletics or, or, or whatever industry. And so you really just have to have to go right, get right through it, uh, confront issues if they are serious um, right when they happen. But you know, I've been fortunate to, to not deal with a lot of challenge uh, in that area. Um, and then what was the, the opportunities? Successes, surprises. Su successes and surprises. Um, yeah, well, I just, this is my first director of athletics position. I uh, hope to be here a long time. I use the word first. Um, well, my chancellor just announced that he's moving across town to Marquette after one year of me being on the job. So that was a little bit of a surprise um, because I've gotten that question quite a bit about any surprises um, at Milwaukee. And, um, you know, really, I, I was pretty educated walking in. I'd been in the league before at, at GB and uh, stayed connected with people. So I knew the opportunities and challenges there. So not a lot of um, surprises with respect to being a woman. Um, you know, not really many at all. Maybe that's the biggest surprise is uh, people have been just wonderful and uh, building relationships is such a big part of it and men and women do that I think equally as well. And so if you if you take the time to do that, you'll, you'll usually be just fine um, in a le leadership role as a, a woman or a man. My take, opinion. But. Thank you. Take a pause. Any uh, questions from the audience? Anybody have any questions? Go ahead. One sport or specialize, right? Um, I was actually just had this discussion the other day. I think if, for example, I think McKenna Larson is a great example of a great three-sport athlete. However, I've seen, um, you know, some of my girls who, in my opinion, could be really good basketball players and go on to play at the next, or are going on to play at the next level, for example, <coughs> do other sports, <coughs> but aren't as successful in those, in those sports. And I guess, I think it's, I don't know how you would tell a student that, but I think if, you know, you're gonna dominate every sport you play, I think, why not play every sport? However, I think on the flip side that if you are really good at one sport, why are you wasting your time running cross country if you're, you know, you're a senior in high school and you're on the JV team? So, you know, I regardless that I think each um, sport teaches the athlete different skills and those types of things, but I think if you wanted to be really good or you were really good at one sport, that's where you kind of need to differentiate or recognize what, what are your strengths, what are your weaknesses. Um, uh, in, in North America right now, there's uh, quite a concern that hockey players are becoming unathletic. And um, the problem uh, with that unathleticism is they never truly realize their potential as a hockey player and, and the unathleticism is a result of them specializing at a real young age and 
I get really excited when uh, I see um, you know questionnaires completed that show that uh, they're a multi-sport athlete and um, you know eventually at some point uh, when they get uh, whether it's 11th grade, 12th grade, where they uh, are playing on club teams now and they can't uh, play uh, three sports, maybe it's only two, um, then, then I understand that. But um, I, I think it's a really good thing uh, when we have, um, you know, young girls and, and boys playing, you know, multi-sports. And certainly on our, our, on our women's hockey team at St. Norbert College, we've had some success with uh, two-sport athletes, and it's just finding that balance and that right compromise so that um, they can all have success in each of those sports. However, I will say there is a concern for the two-sport athlete at the collegiate level, and that's uh, the missed opportunity for um, things like internships and, and uh, service uh, uh, on the campus and maybe the potential for study abroads and things of that nature. Well, being a parent and having children, um, it's difficult <clears throat> for a parent <clears throat> to go and watch your child play and then get run over by a kid on a continual basis. Uh, it's also difficult um, for your children when they go and they can't play because the other kids in the team uh, are so much better because they specialize. And I think <clears throat> at the end of the day, college education, and there's so much money out there available in college athletics in terms of scholarship, I think a lot of parents are seeing that and of course if their child can perform at an elite level they're going to get some scholarship money so i think it's almost a a threefold thing um, personally i would prefer to see my children play more than one sport although well, i've got twin daughters that didn't play softball this year but that had to do with the commitment level that was involved and they were worried about their studies uh, in that regard uh, and then i had a son who actually plays one sport now he plays golf as well he's got a stress fracture in his back but i I think that my biggest thing, I think, is that parents don't want to see their kids get run over by other kids. They're tired of you put your kid on a field and your, your child can't even compete. And I think parents kind of take, uh, advent, uh, you know, take, some take offense to that and kind of jump at the opportunity to make their kids better than the next one. So as a result, sometimes it goes as drastic as to see some, you know, fights in stands, whether it be what's, whatever sport where fans get in stands and do some things potentially that wouldn't be in the best interest of the game. So I think there's a lot involved there. Person, I think injury is another thing. I think kids aren't balanced. I think sometimes some of the injury that happens from some of these things are probably a result of overuse of the same muscles. I know when I played as a kid, I played every sport from sunup to sundown, and I, I know I can speak for Sarah too because I know Sarah pretty well, sunup to sundown, and you don't get injured very much because you play so many sports. So I think... Um, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a very touchy situation. Parents call me all the time and ask, should my child just play one sport? I, personally, I think it's good to play a bunch of sports. I think if you're any good at all, the scouts are going to find you. Uh, that's my opinion, but uh, that's, a, that's a long subject. Coach Tilly? Um, I'm a, I come from a little different perspective because when I started my career and for the first at least 10 to 12 years, I coached volleyball, basketball, and softball. Um, so these poor kids that had that play three sports had me as their coach for three sports. <laughs> uh, that had to be pretty uh, horrible. Um, so I, you know, I came to understand a little bit about um, you know what their needs and 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 they did very well. I, you know, now I complain all the time if I have a volleyball player that wants to play basketball. There's a four week overlap and I remember that you know the you know we went from volleyball practice to basketball practice you know just like nothing happened so um, I can appreciate um, the fact and and I think it is uh, difficult nowadays for them to excel in multi-sports um, there is different combinations that work pretty well volleyball and softball works pretty well because you have that middle section to you know kind of you know catch up on things uh, volleyball basketball is obviously horrible um track and field is is actually okay um and at the division three level because we we want to have them pursue all that they can so if i have a a person that 
that wants to do more than one sport, we allow them to do it. Um, we give them the opportunity uh, to do that. Um, I know in most other divisions they don't allow that. Um, and, you know, whether it's their decision, though. You know, we don't, as coaches, I don't say that you should not play volleyball um, if you want to play basketball or you shouldn't play softball if you want to play basketball. I let them decide. And I think that um, keeps them happy and, and, and keeps me happy. And that's my job is to keep all the student athletes very happy. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions from the audience? Go ahead. Can you, you said the recruiting of poor economic background? Yes, so for athletes, um, so in sports, especially at the collegiate level, the literature tells us that most of the athletes that make it to that level are athletes that come from um, backgrounds that can afford the travel teams or they can afford to uh, go to all these different games to go to these coaches' camps. As coaches, if at all, how do you control for that to make sure that you're able to recruit the best players, not just the I spent five years at the University of Michigan uh, around the Detroit area. I think there's a lot of um, athletes around there that probably don't have the resources to be able to uh, compete the way potentially some of the other athletes have. Um, that's really a good question. I, there's a lot of student athletes out there that, re there's a lot of, I don't want to say agents because that's really not a good word, but there's a lot of, a lot of bird dogs out there, if you will, that are really kind of reporting back to you, letting you know where all these athletes are, uh, whether in high school or even junior. It gets down into junior high right now where a lot of ki these kids get seen. So I think from a recruiting perspective, uh, you know who a lot of these kids are because uh, the powers to be within those areas potentially that are economically deprived or don't have the finances to be able to play in the AAU programs uh, kind of let you know that. Um, so we probably would utilize that as much as you can, probably. Putting people on staff that are probably more connected to those areas that, um, that can reach out, and those areas will reach out equally back, because I think there's a, at times there can be a gap in communication uh, between those two, and I think you've got to get people on your staff that can shrink that gap where the information can be shared across the table both, so it's, um, so all the kids are getting an opportunity, but uh, again, I, I spent five years in the Big Ten, and I think that the, the college athletics is really doing a wonder for a lot of players like that, potentially, that had they not had the opportunity, wouldn't, you know, wouldn't be productive citizens, potentially. But I think the fact they've gotten the opportunity, the colleges and universities, and the NCAA in particular, has really taken that upon themselves to really give these kids an opportunity, give them some extra help where needed, uh, if the case might be, and turned out some great citizens as a result. So uh, I think there is a gap. I think you're correct. I think finding someone that can shrink that gap, and of course, when they get them there, make sure that they succeed. And I think the resources enable you to do that, if that answers your question, I hope. Uh, well, ho hockey's a, a pretty expensive sport to play. Um, I certainly know that I had two kids that uh, uh, went through it, one who's done playing now, and the other one who's just finished uh, Four years playing at Shattuck St. Mary's, and and um, you know what? The, the neat thing about uh, hockey it's 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 a big uh, community that is trying to reach out to those um, groups of uh, uh, youth children um, that may come from um, 
lower socioeconomic backgrounds, and the NHL is doing a great job in, in, in promoting the game and trying to get as many kids, kids involved with uh, the game through scholarships and, and whatnot so that they can actually afford equipment and, and get involved. But uh, for me, um, you know, I, I go everywhere to recruit. And, um, you know, St. Norbert College does uh, a very good job with, uh, uh, you know, those that are in need uh, are provided with the demonstrated need. And, um, you know, we, we don't, uh, you know, if, if they're going to make us better, we're going to bring them in. And we have a very diverse locker room from all over the place and different backgrounds. I think my recruiting is, is entirely different because I see a lot of these kids at AAU tournaments and those kinds of things, but those aren't the players that I get. Um, very rarely um, do I get a lot of, of, of those types of players. So most of my recruiting um, is really going and looking at, you know, all conference players, uh, people that are teams that make it to the, to the uh, state, and really traveling the roads and going to high school games and, and, and seeing people there, not even knowing what their, their economic status is or, or um, anything else. And, and then usually contact the coach, get an address, get contact, those kinds of things and go from there. So I don't have a real um, sense for, um, you know, I see someone from a high school team not knowing anything about them um, and then find out more about them and then, you know, learn what their situation is and those kinds of things and do everything that I can uh, to uh, make a college experience uh, something that they, they can do. So the kids that I see at AEU and those kinds of things are generally not the kids that, that I recruit. Thank you. We'll get back to the questions. I just want to fire this question at uh, the coaches and Amanda. I want to ask you about communications. You have cell phones, you have texting, Twitter, Facebook, to name a few. And it allows athletes and coaches to uh, express themselves in just seconds. What are the challenges you face with the instant communication today? Do you establish any rules when it comes to cell phones, texting, social media? Do you like it? Amanda, I'll start with you about maybe with your coaching staff. I mean, do you know of any rules that they set aside for social media, texting, cell phones, things like that? Well, common sense certainly applies. I think our coaches um, try to try to uh, position it as an educational opportunity. That if you create too many rules for young people, uh, you're dictating too many parts of their life, um, and so you have to sort of set some guidelines for them about the choices they make and the goals that they have for themselves. And so the way I talk about it with students who find themselves in challenging positions, whether it's social media or whatever it is, that uh, every choice they make gets them either closer or further from the goal that they have for themselves, <clears throat> hopefully many goals. And uh, every time they have an opportunity to make a choice about tweeting something or putting something on their Facebook or making a decision to do something on campus, um, you hope that they take a moment and just think about their goals. So that's the way we try to talk about it, rather than controlling every, op you know, every everything that they um, they have in front of them. That that would be nearly impossible, particularly when you're dealing with adults uh, on a large campus. So um, that's kind of the approach we take, uh, really, just from a position of being educators. Sarah, how about you at the high school level? Yeah, um, <clears throat> I do set some rules actually, because I learned, I guess, my first year from some parents. I, even actually after last year when we won, the, we won the state championship, I had a parent send me a nasty text message after we won, just chewing me out because her daughter didn't play. And, um, you know, even in my first year, I think kids, it's a safety net to send a text message and tell you something. And they would say, they say a lot of things over text messages that they will not say to your face. And um, that's been one of my rules at our, rule, at our rules meeting at the beginning of the year, every year. It's just that if you if there's a problem, you ha I encourage the student athletes to come talk to me first rather than a parent, because a lot of times the problem isn't with the student athlete; it's the parents that have a problem. So I've always encouraged the girls to come talk to me if there is a problem, rather than sending me a text message or if you can't make it to a practice or so if so there's some type of conflict, just call me rather than send me a text message because I think it's just a problem in society nowadays too that. Kids don't know how to communicate face-to-face. -face. Everything's done through text messaging or through social media. 
And that's one thing I am encouraging a lot of my players to do is just come talk to me to my face or set up a meeting, whatever it may be, and especially when there are problems on the team because, like I said, a lot of times it's been the parents that have the problems, not the players, because I'll, I told, I told my parents that last year, if you send me an email or send me a text message, I'm gonna go right to your kids and ask them, um, you know, tell them that I got this email, because a lot of parents will send me an email and say, but please don't tell my daughter I sent this. So that was a problem for me too, because like I said, a lot of times it hasn't, it wasn't the players that were having a problem with in the beginning, so I really am trying to uh, encourage that, you know, face-to-face -face communication, because I think it's good for the girls too, and I think it's something, it's a, it's a lifelong skill that they need to learn, and you know, a lot of times kids don't know how to communicate anymore because they're so used to doing it through a cell phone. Coach Borseth. We, we run social media training for our players. Um, I think it's important that they understand that written text can never be taken back. So I think they need to be really cognizant of that. Uh, and the best way to do it is really if you've got the resources to bring someone in that can kind of investigate your program and kind of put things up on a board to show you the things that your student athletes are, are posting out there and the kids' faces turn three sheets of red because their name is associated with, but it's out there. So I think that, and I agree with Sarah, it's a lot easier for kids nowadays to type things than it is for them to say things. So I think it's important that they understand, first of all, what they do type written is very important. That they're very, If it's not good, don't write it. And we have training with that. And the second thing is it's good to communicate face-to-face, -face, which is extremely important. As far as us being able to text student-athletes, we're permitted to text student-athletes once they become juniors in high school. And we can text and phone call them anytime we want. Uh, I was at a Big Ten meeting one time, and Joe Paterno was in there, and he, I don't know why he said this, but he said, it's for some reason or other, I find some, because they were talking about, should we lift the texting ban, let people text whenever they want to? And Joe said, I think I find a problem with a 60-year-old man texting a 14-year-old girl at 3 o'clock in the morning, which brought chuckles. But in all reality, you're texting and you're, your social media and your availability to talk kids now is pretty much unlimited. And from a coaching perspective, it's good because you can show your kids your interest. Uh, from a player's student athlete perspective, I think it's going to eventually slow recruiting down because kids are going to have a lot more options. Have you ever had an athlete come to you and look at, and say, look at what someone said about me? The other side were people from fans, people from the outside texting in or making a comment about a specific athlete? With regard to a social media message? Right. Um, not really. Those things generally show up on the USA Today if they're, if they're that bad. So, I, you know, I, I just think, you know, like I say, we bring our student athletes in and we kind of investigate and steal some stuff off their sites, post it up, let them take a look at it and say, okay, this is what's out there. So it's good to know. I want to play off uh, Sarah's response a little bit about uh, parents. At the high school level, college level, parental involvement in athletics, uh, is an increasing problem. How do you deal with that? How do you deal with parents? I'm sure Sarah sees it more at the high school level. Maybe not, but uh, I'd like to get your comments on that. How do you deal with parents that question coaching strategies, players, playing time, things like that? Probably in my entire career, I've had three instances where that has occurred. And I think from a coaching's perspective, I am extremely honest with the role of my student athletes. They sometimes don't explain that role to their parents. Um, but I, I had just been blessed that um, I think if I, if I, you know, am honest and straightforward and, and, you know, this is the way it is that most of the parents that at least I have come in contact accepts that. Um, because it's much more prevalent in high school is the reason I did not start out coaching high school. I went right to college because um, I think that would probably be one of the hardest things to deal with. And I know that it's changed a lot of people's uh, careers in terms of coaching uh, because they just could not put up with the parents anymore. But I've been blessed in my career um, that I have not had any real negative 
uh, comments or anything else. About the social media thing, though, the, the one rule that I have, and I don't really do all that stuff, so even though I have a Twitter account, that person right there is the one that, you know, kind of runs it and operates it. Um, the one thing, I have rules in terms of when we're together as a group, we don't have cell phones, all right, that we, you know, if we're sharing a meal or, you know, doing those kinds of things. The other thing that I saw, um, and I think it was when our men's team was playing Grinnell and um, whatever his name is, Taylor, uh, you know, said he was going to hit St. Norbert up for 50 points. I mean, those kinds of things are just, you know, out of bounds. And, and so as far as rules go, that's, they cannot comment about another player or what they're going to do. You know, just you can say we, you know, beat this team or that team, but uh, we do not make it personal. And, and, and the other part of that that's really good is that even though I don't do Facebook or any of that kind of stuff, I do – I am – be friends with people. So I understand and know what my kids are doing, um, which is kind of helpful sometimes. Um, if, if we have a 48-hour rule in terms of alcohol use, and, and all of a sudden the night before I see in their Facebook that they were at a party, you know, then I can kind of you know, catch up with them. So that's all I use it for. As far as for me with parenting, my I think my first year as the varsity coach at Notre Dame, and I remember when I took the job at Notre Dame, everybody's like, well, good luck with the parents, because I hear they have some crazy parents at Notre Dame. And that was, a, I was like, wow, well, how bad are these parents? And my first year, and each year as I've gone on, they've the parents actually have been gotten a lot better. This year I had great parents. <laughs> Last year, a little bit worse, and the first year were probably the worst I had, but... Um, and every year I've learned actually how to manage the parents a little bit better. And I've done that by, like Coach Tilly said, I, I let the girls know right away what their roles are on the team. I have post-season um, post meetings with the girls to talk about like what they can improve upon for the summer. And then at the beginning of the year, too, I meet with every girl individually just to talk about what I see, what I see them doing for the year just their role in our team and how I see that playing a part. And then when I, we have a beginning of the year meeting with the parents as well that I kind of lay out the expectations for them. And I, I'm kind of a straight shooter as well. And I, I tell them right from the beginning, I'm only going to play seven to eight girls. All the girls aren't going to play. And I've always been that way. I, just with the teams I've had, those, that's the number of girls I play. And, you know, the girls that don't play, still do play an important part and they they know their role as well and they've always been okay with that and if they haven't been okay with it then they typically quit and i've had some good players actually quit especially last year after this um, state tournament because they weren't happy that they didn't get to play in or a, a sophomore played before you know a junior on the team and they and they quit and at the time it seemed like wow we're losing some really good players here for the next year but it really was, it's been a blessing in disguise because those players that have quit on me have kind of, um, you know, helped our team chemistry. And really, I think if some of those players did continue to play, I think it would have been worse for our team chemistry. And I don't know if our success would have been uh, as good just for those reasons. So I guess setting high expectations <coughs> and clear expectations, letting the girls know their roles, and that's been pretty helpful for me and the success of our team. Coach Borsa? Uh, yeah, I'm going to kind of go back to your motivating versus abuse question because that one wasn't answered, so it's um, it, all part of this. I think as, um, as coaches, our jobs are to teach. Uh, and I think when we recruit players, we have a vision for that player when we bring them in. And I think at some point they have to be rewarded providing they do everything we ask them to do, jump all the hoops, work hard, study hard, be a good teammate, be a coachable, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I'm kind of a senior-laden guy. I think people that have put their time in should play. It's kind of the way I am. Um, and sometimes it's going to come at the expense of maybe not winning as many games as a result of that. But uh, I think sometimes we put winning ahead of teaching, which is not really the right thing to do. But big-time college athletics, it's a, it's a business, so it's a little different. Uh, but I, I, I believe we're teachers, and I think that uh, if the parents know, and you do get calls from parents even at the collegiate level, and generally when a parent calls, they've got a concern, regardless if it's playing time or what it, what it is. I think as coaches, it's our job, good to be a teacher, too, to treat their kids with respect. 
teach your kids with respect, give them an opportunity, uh, give them all the attention they deserve to give them an opportunity to play when it presents itself, do that. And I think at the end of the day, as long as you do that with the student athlete, I think the parents can see you building their child and building their confidence up and eventually they get rewarded at the end of the day. Uh, it's really difficult. And I hear a lot of young coaches say, well, we've got a great eighth grade and freshman class coming in. And I'm thinking, well, what about your juniors and seniors? Because those are really the kids that are really setting the tone for those young kids. What's expected? How do you act? And when coach uh, leans on you, how do you act? Uh, I worked for a fellow named Pat Gallon, who was a football coach, Hall of Famer, uh, years ago. And he was always a big one about keep the freshmen around. Just baby them. If they make a mistake, don't holler at them. If they, they're late, don't do anything. Lean on the upperclassmen. And those kids are going to show the young kids what it takes. And as a result, those kids feed off of that. And you're hoping you're feeding them the right stuff. And when it comes to that point, eventually, you, know, you kind of take the parents out of the picture because the parents can see your program rolling over the seniors every year. And it's their chance. It's kind of a pecking order kind of thing. So that's kind of my strategy. Amanda? Um, just a comment first on the parent uh, involvement. In collegiate sports, our, our student athletes, almost to a person, are adults. So uh, we have a responsibility to the federal government called FERPA uh, to not disclose. So where it gets tricky for us is not necessarily in the one-on-one -on -one conversations, because that does exist, um, care, care with what you can share, uh, but when they are out in the community uh, talking. And that's often what, what I see and hear about, and there's only so much you can do to diffuse that message because you have a responsibility to not disclose uh, certain pieces of information, so they're sort of free uh, with a blank slate to, to do that, and that's really hard to manage. I, I don't have a solution, I just know it exists, and, uh, and you can only do your very best to, you know, as Kevin cited, to treat, treat your athletes with respect. Um, to the teaching, I was so glad to hear Kevin say that. I, I worked with Kevin for almost seven years. Uh, I had the privilege to do that. And, and he's, a number of his former players are here, so they could comment far better than me. And unless your practices have changed in the last eight years, Kevin, if you're, and you've seen him on the sidelines, I imagine, as passionate as he is, uh, he's a teacher in, the pract in his practices. I mean, it's, it's like a classroom in there. I mean, he's, he's taken the time to, to uh, walk his kids through things and respects the way that, uh, that they uh, need to receive information, and um, it's a, it's, I think it's a model. So um, I'm glad that you, that you were able to comment on that. Coach Morgan? Yeah, for, for me, it, uh, it all begins in the whole recruiting process uh, when communicating both the prospective student athletes and the parents and helping them understand what uh, our philosophy is and, and developing those trusting and caring relationships. And um, at the beginning of the year, though, what I do is uh, I send out this really nice uh, letter to the parents with a positive spin on it, uh, talking about uh, here's what I feel uh, makes our program successful. And, um, you know, and our parent group, uh, I haven't had uh, a parent call me in the four years. Maybe uh, Tim Bald has <laughs> received a call. I don't know. But um, we've had a pretty special uh, start in developing our program, and it all starts with building those uh, trusting and caring relationships. Uh, but I do think that the letter at the beginning of the year helps the parents understand how to best support their uh, daughter uh, with, within our program. Any what? questions? Can I just say one last thing? Sure, go ahead, Coach. Anybody wants a copy of something, it's called Neither Have I, and it's a story about a parent, a parent who stuck up for the coaches and told the child that if you think you deserve a chance to play, go out and prove it. It's a, it's a tear-jerking story I got out of Reader's Digest 25 years ago. It's a great read, it really is. If everybody wants a copy, see me afterwards, I'd be glad to get you a copy, you'll like it. I'm trying to see right now if it's on the internet. Let's see if I can find it. <laughs> <laughs> <Don't tell. laughs> Go ahead with your question, sir. Uh, we've had uh, three uh, student athletes uh, that have um, uh, gone on and do a study abroad uh, thus far in our four years of our program. Uh, um, 
and it's all been uh, very rewarding for them. You know, how I'm able to make it work for the student athlete is that uh, should they want to do a study abroad, uh, I'd like to see them do it in the first term because, you know, they're, they're not um, compromising the, the second half where the bulk of our season is being played and are pushed to the playoffs. And uh, when they come back, certainly um, they're a step behind and uh, it takes them a lot of work to catch up but the support is there. Um, I, I'm just a big believer in uh, the, the complete uh, student athlete experience. And, and I think uh, the non-athletes on campus are able to uh, truly benefit from all those uh, other experiences that typically athletes aren't able to benefit from. We ha actually happen to have uh, um, the president of our uh, SAC, or co-chair rather of our SAC committee, the Student Athlete Advisory Committee who was um, offered an internship, uh, pretty much a paid internship that led to a job right away. Uh, she graduated and walked into the job. But she came in and said, Coach, I'm, I'm, I'm really not sure what I should do here because, you know, I, I want to stay involved with the program. Uh, I really want to continue to play, but, you know, I have this job that's, that's waiting for me if I do this internship. And so... You know, uh, we found a way for her to make it work, and she was still able to play in our senior game at the end of the year. And and she's a proud alum that uh, is um, got a job now. Um, you know, so it's just it's it's a personal belief. I don't think uh, everyone shares that belief, but you know, having kids and knowing what I want to see my kids get out of their college experiences is, is something that I believe in. I can say from a player's perspective, at playing at Green Bay that. We, I thought we had a very broad experience as well. You know, we were, we played basketball, but we were also in the community quite a bit. Um, and obviously we always had study tables. Our academics were always the first and foremost important thing that we had to do. And luckily we had some really uh, flexible professors on campus that allowed for that as well. So I think the biggest thing about being so involved too when you when you are a student athlete is it teaches you time management and then just going out in the community is where you make all those connections and you really are networking with so many people because once you graduate those are the people that are coming back and saying hey sir do you want to um, you know I'm interested in hiring you for this position but you meet so many people and you network with so many people when you are out in the community and not part of a team that it really opens up uh, a lot of doors I think for the student athletes just being so involved rather than just you know focusing on the sport they're playing, which I don't really think that's the case anywhere. I think every student athlete is giving back to the community in some way, focusing on their academics, um, whatever it may be. Any other questions? Go ahead. Were you in the Big Ten when they added Nebraska? <laughs> yeah. So I, there's a firsthand experience. You know, I, I, the impact is not insignificant. Um, and I, this is my personal perspective on this, that we've maybe lost a little bit of our perspective um, when it comes to um, the impact, uh, travel, their responsibilities as students. Uh, there are many, many ways to support student athletes, even if they're on the road. There are. I mean, there, and, and we're getting better at that. I, I, you know, and I do believe that. Um, I also recognize that resources are important. Um, I, I recognize that as we want to um, feed them un, in an unlimited way, which is a new rule, and provide all kinds of other things like cost of attendance, we're going to have to find ways to fund that. So I, I, there's such a tension there. I can't, I can't agree with you more that, uh, that the impact is not good and not insignificant. I'm, I'm just not sure 
uh, the right people are at the table necessarily to make those decisions. That's a strong statement I recognize, but I, I would say that to most people. Um, so I, I'll, I'll let Kevin tell you a little bit about the firsthand experience on those athletes. I don't know, and your question was, what effect does it have on the student athlete? I don't know that the student athlete probably feels it as much as the people on top feel it. I think the student athlete is there to do their job. Uh, like Coach said, they have a philosophy and standards that are set for a program. Uh, you're going to have study tables. You're going to have expectations from an academic perspective. You're going to have social expectations. You're going to have athletic expectations. So <clears throat> in that regards, I don't know that the student athlete feels as much. Um, they're going to feel it in the unlimited meals plan that they're having, the actual cost of of uh, attending a school. Um, they may potentially feel it if uh, families are permitted to travel. You're allowed to pay for travel for teams. So in that regard, that would have a very positive effect, uh, maybe on some student athletes that wouldn't be able to afford to have their parents travel with them, those type of things. But in terms of pressures uh, and playing, I don't know if the student feels it as much potentially as the, as the higher ups feel it, because it's a, it's a resources thing, obviously. Panel, I want to ask this question. How do crowds affect the outcomes of games? And what are ways to increase attendance in women's sports? Anyone that wants to start? Coach Tilly, you want to start? I think any time that you can have a Six player, if you will, um, you know, cheering your athletes. I think it, it obviously motivates them a little bit more. Um, I I remember a time when um, we were in the NCAA in the second round, and and we had to go to Carlton, who was ranked fifth in the nation, and the the place was like a pit, and it was just wall to wall people, you know, obviously cheering against us. Um, so we were in the locker room, and I was talking to the kids, and I'm like, well, let's pretend that all these people are here watching us and cheering for us. So we stepped on the floor, and all in boo, you know, all over the place. So <laughs> that kind of shot that. Um, <laughs> but actually, it really did, because it was so loud and you know, and, and we ended up winning that game, but we used that atmosphere for our benefit and not for, you know, <coughs> um, you know, making it like an excuse. I mean, it was, it was, it was really outstanding. Um, as most of you know, we play double headers with the men. So I think the, the thing that hurts a lot, and we alternate whether who goes first and those kinds of things, but it, it's kind of disheartening for the women's team when we played second this year and, you know, the men played, and then, um, you know, most of the fans leave <laughs> for our game. Um, but, you know, I think we've always had a pretty good attendance. I think we lead our, our league in, in attendance. I think the, the support that our kids get, um, not only from their peers in terms of their, the, the students at St. Norbert, but I also think that we have a great support of their parents. Um, and I think that it helps them and it encourages them, it motivates them. Um, you know, I can only do so much um, with that. So having, you know, and, and I think you have to put a good product out there for people to come to watch you. So that's my job is to, you know, be the best that we can be and have people see us and then want to come back and see us um, again. So I think there is a big difference between men's and women in terms of attendance and obviously those kinds of things. So. Um, you know, I think if we put a good product out there, people will come. So, you know, the saying, if you build it, they'll, they'll come. Well, I think if, if we put a good product out there, they'll come and, and want to watch us. Coach Borseth? Uh, I, crowds are, yeah, it, you know, it's fun to play in front of a crowd, whether they're cheering for you or cheering for the other team. It doesn't make any difference. It's really uh, warming when you come onto a, 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 an arena to play or your athletic venue, whatever it is, and there's people there watching. Because I think from a student athlete's perspective, and it's about student athlete experience, it really is, to see people out there that really take an active interest in the game. I think the majority of the crowds in women's sports, they, they're, they even cheer for the other team. They just want to see good play. I've had a number of games that we played where after the game, win or lose, the other team would come up and say, 
you know, you really got a good team, the kids play hard, this and that, and there's, a matter of fact, I've even got emails and from parents and fans from different communities uh, about our team and the way our, our kids uh, represent themselves and represent their city and their university, which is really a good thing, I guess. So I think crowds are really fun. I think everybody likes, likes the, I think the officials have the toughest part with the crowd. And that's not a dig. I think our officials do a great job. I think they're very educated at our level, particularly. Uh, and there's no one out there that I question their integrity at all. But I think from their perspective, the county of the boos may put a little more pressure on them. I, that's my take on it. Um, but in, in, in terms for us, increasing attendance, I think it's important. One, you win. I think if you've got exciting teams that can play, obviously, uh, people are going to come out. But I think your base of fan support is extremely important. I think your involvement in the community, uh, from your players uh, being seen in the community, uh, your being available to those people. Uh, we've done things after games to, I remember the first year I got to Green Bay, I stood at the door and shook hands with people, kind of like the pastor at the church as people walked out, just to try to meet people, to try to get them to come back. But I think uh, we try to recruit locally or regionally as much as we can, because I think the parent aspect is really big that the parents can come watch their kids play, and as a result, I think, I know when Julie White was on the panel before this, I think Julie brought panels. Are you here, Julie, still? She brought busloads of people from Mishka to come up to watch play, and I think that's really a lot true for the kids that we have, and I think, uh, I think sooner or later, people, it becomes a, a Saturday afternoon experience or a Thursday night experience for us where people of the community have grabbed onto it equally as well and come out because it becomes the thing to do, which is really good, so... Marketing does work in some regard, but nothing uh, from a point of having a putting a good competitive uh, team on the court, uh, having people that they know, whether it's through re regional recruiting or getting them out into the community. Anyone else? I, I just really quickly want to tell a quick story about my time at Green Bay, and Kevin, you may or may not remember this. <clears throat> we didn't have a season ticket base in women's basketball at Green Bay. Six. Six, I remember, Six. I was one of them. I swear, I mean, this is true. And our marketing person at the time, I went in there and I said, you know, we really should have season tickets. We should promote season tickets for women's basketball. People really like it. The people that come respond. Our kids are in a community, you know, like Kevin and Sarah said. And uh, we should do this. Oh, we've tried that before. You know, I said, well, maybe we ought to try it again because it was sort of five or six years ago we tried that before. And so I tell you that story and now, you know, now you know if you've ever been to a Green Bay game. I mean, they, they've got quite a, a fan base and a wonderful season ticket. I think it actually exceeds the men or, is, right? Yeah, it's close. Um, so, so, I mean, there is some responsibility to market and I think you need to be in the community. You need to have a great product or, or uh, a fun blend of basketball or whatever the sport is, but, but certainly we have a responsibility to try to market our women's sport programs, and maybe it's not marketing the exact same way that you're marketing your men's programs, because they maybe uh, have different audiences or whatever the case might be. Coach Morgan? Yeah, um, this has been uh, a goal both at D1 and D3 to try and uh, grow the crowds uh, at our arenas and it certainly does add to the student athlete experience and it certainly uh, does uh, give you energy and um, our, our team before we start the game because sometimes we don't have many people there they're creating their own energy by uh, slamming their sticks on the boards and getting all jacked up for the game and uh, but I do have a, a really good story where the crowd uh, helped put us over the top and was three years ago when we played against River Falls and and River Falls is, uh, you know, they, they have an incredible environment and atmosphere. And when they score a goal, they got this super loud horn that goes off and this loud music. And, and we're playing them in the um, conference championship in our third year. And it's 2 nothing for them. And their crowd it was mostly River Falls people there. We had a pretty small crowd that was there supporting us, but very loud. And, and uh, you could feel it getting louder and louder and louder because River Falls was going to win it. And then a minute 11... Uh, seconds left, we score our first goal, it's two to one. And then the crowd starts to give them a little bit more energy. Come on, let's go here. And our crowd now is picking it up here and we scored another goal with 11 seconds left to tie the game. And it just totally took their crowd out of it. And now their kids are flat as can be and we're all jacked up. We come out in overtime, end up winning the game. Like that was an unbelievable experience. So some of the things that we're doing um, at St. Norbert, our student athlete advisory committee created these brother sister teams. And you know, Oswego State University came out to play us this year and we had the whole track team during J term, I think it was the track team, 
that came out and uh, you know it was halfway through the um, first period and they all come in and they're all excited for the game and and next thing you know he could feel this energy this lift and um, so youth hockey uh, getting youth hockey involved free admission wearing a jersey we uh, piggyback with the gamblers and try and stagger some games with uh, our men's hockey team who sell out for most of their games throughout the year and um, another neat thing is the the uh, social room because we want to make it an event so our goals club uh, run by all, a, a, a parent group uh, uh, they make sure that they have you know some frosties for them before the game in between periods and and after the game and and then lastly at the national championship level what we're trying to do is partner with uh, USA Hockey to hold their national championships in conjunction with uh, D1 and or D3 national championships which is going to be a lot of work so yeah, it's pretty exciting to see the growth here and we, we love uh, seeing the attendance grow each year. Well, that hour flew by. Let's hear it for our panel. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you so much. Uh, I just want to say, you know, as a parent, I keep saying this, but I took notes, and so I'm not going to be that parent. <laughs> but we really appreciate you for sharing your passion with us and, and with your student athletes and also being the role models and teachers that we need and in your strength and continuing to grow women's sports. So we really appreciate it. And I know everyone in the audience, uh, we could continue this conversation, right? So uh, thanks again, really appreciate it today. I uh, wanna let you know the wonderful Lambeau Field staff is gonna be cleaning up our tables here. I don't think we made that much of a mess, but it's gonna be an easy one. We're gonna have a lunch buffet right outside the room here it begins at noon, so then you can go through the buffet and then bring your lunch back on in here. And then you're going to be able to enjoy our final speaker of the convention. I know you're going to enjoy her, so you want to stick around for that. And then, of course, the Lambeau Field Tour is coming up at 1.30 if you signed up or if you want to sign up. The registration table is right outside. You can get tickets for that and, again, sign up. So thanks again, and uh, take a little break, and then we'll see you back here uh, at around noon. Thank you too.